the Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Good morning, listeners. We are experimenting with a different format today. Dr. Frank recently gave an update on orthobiologics at our Denver meeting. I'm going to give you the audio recording of the talk. She discusses PRP, cellular therapy, and some on hyaluronic acid. And she provides us with information on some of the current literature, as well as current clinical applications of the PRP and cellular therapy. She also provides us uh, some of her own experience and how she incorporates these treatments in her practice. I think this will be just as informative, and I hope you like the format. If you go to PubMed in 2022, just a couple months ago, you'll get 14,000 plus hits on PRP. If you, and you'll see those hits have increased year to year to year, exploded in the last five years. If you go to Google, which is where all your patients are going to, in 2020, 20 million hits within a second. 2021, 44 million hits within a second. Anyone want to guess what 2022 showed? Close to a billion hits, all right? So this is what our patients are seeing. And this makes sometimes life pretty miserable for us, right? Because they're seeing those advertisements that you can cure hip bone-on-bone arthritis with a little bit of PRP, and they want you to do it. And they're willing to pay. They're willing to bring out the money. So we have to be aware of what the public is seeing so we can educate them and anticipate their questions. So let's look at the science. Does PRP work? And this is for knee osteoarthritis. If you look at these studies, it doesn't work. If you look at these studies, it absolutely works. And if you look at this study, it might work. So this is what Murphy would say to that. Wouldn't be so thrilled with that because how do we use this data to guide our practice? Why is the PRP literature so confusing? Jorge Chala, good colleague over at Rush in Chicago and did a lot of his training out here in, in Colorado, put together this systematic review of over 100 papers looking at PRP. Guess what? Only 12% reported on how they even process the PRP. So we can't even publish good literature amongst ourselves because if we were to, we might find results perhaps that we don't want to see. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why we don't always report all the steps that we use in our, in our own research and our own practice. But without reporting those steps, then how do we, the rest of us, figure out how to apply these findings to our patients? So there's a critical need for standardization and consensus. I've done my best to kind of summarize what I think are some of the better papers in the literature to help guide us. So in 2019 and 2022, so the last three years, PRP does seem favorable for osteoarthritis. There's three papers here that I've highlighted, in particular, leukocyte-poor PRP with modification of symptoms at six months and up to 12 months. Now, steroid sometimes has an earlier, better result within the first few weeks, and I think that that's very practical and reasonable. But for longer-term durability of symptom relief, PRP seems to be a very logical option for patients with mild to moderate OA. It does not modify disease. It does not regenerate cartilage or meniscus. It does not reverse the OA. It treats the symptoms. Asking your patients to understand the difference between disease modification and symptom modification sometimes can be very difficult. But you've got to make sure you don't overpromise what PRP can do because I guarantee there are a lot of clinics that are doing that. They're telling patients they can regenerate their joint with a few injections. That's just simply not possible. I wait for the day when it is possible. Excuse me, it is possible. I'll take it myself, my my own knee. I'd love it, but we're just not there yet. Now, an interesting concept is the so-called cocktail, PRP plus HA, and there are a few studies now that suggest a synergistic effect of giving a combined injection of PRP leukocyte poor with HA compared to either one in isolation. So for patients where their insurance covers HA and they still want to boost it with PRP, so to speak, we have the talk, we talk about risk benefits, lack of proven benefit, et cetera, and we typically do offer a combined injection. So my clinical applications for PRP in 2022, and we didn't go through all these because just for the sake of time, but I do use PRP liberally for patients with tennis elbow, patients with patellar tendonitis, although it's plus minus there, but sometimes there's just no other option, and mild to moderate osteoarthritis, and certainly use it as a surgical augment for cartilage and meniscus repair, which again, for the sake of time, we don't have enough to go into. What don't I use it for? Everything you see here. 
So patients really want it for their Achilles and they really want it for their cuff and they really want it to do all the things that you see here. And I just don't offer PRP for this. I tell them, I, if you want it, you'll have to find someone else who's had better results with it. We haven't seen that in our practice. And I'm not willing, even if they're willing to throw cash at us, I'm not willing to accept it. I have to sleep at night. What about stem cells? Oh my gosh, the holy grail. Everyone loves stem cells until we talk about stem cells. And then we start to look like this. A little bit skeptical. So what exactly are stem cells? Well, the NIH has this definition. They say that they are unspecialized cells that are capable of dividing and renewing themselves and give rise to specialized type of cells. I think that sounds reasonable. That's what we learned you know, back in the day. There's a few different types of stem cells, adult, embryonic, induced pluripotent stem cells. This is probably all sounding familiar. And then we talk about mesenchymal stem cells, which are more of a differentiated adult type stem cell. And that's referred to as the MSC. But the MSC has also been called mesenchymal stromal cells, mesenchymal signaling cells, medicinal signaling cells, lots of terms for MSC. The take home point on MSCs is they're found in our native tissue, like bone marrow, adipose, synovium, peripheral blood, tendons, ligaments, et cetera, but at very low concentrations. You have to process the tissue in some way, <coughs> excuse me, to get any sort of stem cell, so to speak, out. Now, I don't use the word stem cell in our clinic because what we end up putting into patients is really not a stem cell or not enough stem cells for me to say, yes, I'm treating you with stem cells. But that's what patients say, and actually a lot of primary care docs say. And so we have to respect the language, but I never tell patients I'm giving you stem cells. I tell them I'm using cellular therapy or I'm getting you growth factors via cells once they're activated. But it's just a language situation. What are common cellular therapies in sports medicine? Bone marrow and adipose-derived MSCs. You can harvest those in a variety of different ways, and we'll go through that a little bit here. So bone marrow-derived MSCs, this is typically bone marrow aspirate. This can be aspirated from a variety of different locations. It's easy to do. Anyone can do this. It's got a high-volume harvest. The only downsides are, of course, cost, like all biologics, and donor site morbidity. This is from one company's brochure, but you can do this with any company that offers this. You can harvest from the calcaneus, from the anterior posterior iliac crest, from the notch within the knee, from the proximal humerus, et cetera. How do you pick a site? Well, there's actually some studies to talk about this and what you should pick. And the summary is all of the studies show that the posterior superior iliac crest gives you the biggest bang for your money there. You're gonna get more stem cells per cc of bone marrow aspirated than anywhere else in the body. But the overall number is so low that clinically this has never been shown to be relevant. It's only been shown in basic science or animal studies. So in my practice, I weigh the pros and cons of the patient's setup versus the procedure that I'm doing. If I'm doing a cuff and I wanna augment it with cells, for example, I'm not gonna put them prone, do their iliac crest on the back, and then sit them in the beach chair and then do their scope. I just don't have the patience for that. So in those cases, I'll typically do the anterior hip or even the proximal humerus. Same for a knee procedure. If I was doing a clinical trial, I probably would use the posterior crest to stay consistent with the literature. But again, I'm a clinical person, and while I love science and I'm a big research dork, I, I want to respect the fact that while the science suggests that the posterior crest is best, clinically it's never been bore out. So I would say do what's best for your practice because you're probably going to be just fine. What are the outcomes? There's a million studies. I'm not going to go through all of them, but when we look at bone marrow used or bone marrow derived MSCs for knee OA and cartilage problems, the take home point, so I see, I'm going to summarize it for you. Bone marrow concentrate is most beneficial as a surgical augment for focal chondral defects of the knee, but for the treatment of general knee OA, there's actually minimal support currently, and PRP is actually much better when we look at the literature now. There's almost no head-to-head -head studies of PRP versus aspirated or concentrated bone marrow aspirate, or BMAC, so to speak, uh, but there, there's certainly isolated studies, and PRP is definitely superior. What about for rotator cuff repair? This is a famous study by Hernigue that compared 45 patients undergoing cuff repair with bone marrow versus cuff repair without bone marrow. They found that the patients with bone marrow had almost double the healing rate compared to the patients without bone marrow. This is imaging based only, not clinically. The Rush Group in Chicago has replicated these results with a more recent study, so certainly more to come on this. And as we all know with rotator cuffs, the devil's in the details, right? If cuff don't heal, we've got a big problem. So whatever we can do to augment the mechanical repair with a biologic solution is what we need to do, and this may be something that we're going toward. 
What about adipose-derived MSCs? So this is a lipoaspirate, not a liposuction, although I wish, because I wish I could have that done and call it a musculoskeletal procedure. Uh, but this is essentially where we take fat from the abdomen, flank, or thigh, especially in your low body fat patients, you've got to go to the flank or thigh. It can be also arthroscopically harvested from the infrapatellar fat pad. And then it's mechanically processed, sometimes a shaking method or a syringe method, and you try to retain the SVF or the stromal vascular fraction that's rich in the MSCs, which are then rich in the growth factors. The pros are just like um, a bone marrow, it's easy to do, honestly, anyone can do this even in the belly. You just have to practice a little bit. The cons are cost and there is some donor site morbidity. One potential advantage of this over bone marrow is there is an increased number of cells per cc of fat compared to per cc of bone marrow. So something to think about and the cells don't seem to decline with age. And so that might be something advantageous for our older patients. Adipose or fat is rich in MSCs. It's contained within a structural scaffold versus bone marrow, which is a more liquid or fluid type of product. And so it can contain more MSCs compared to BMA for the same volume. And within that structural scaffold, they're essentially protected for a longer period of life. When we look at the literature, there's a ton of studies, most of which are outside the US. But again, I'm gonna highlight them and I'm happy to send these to anyone who's interested. But the take home point is that adipose derived MSCs for NeoA are favorable, perhaps more favorable than bone marrow, but the amount, the processing and technique are variable and so certainly more research is needed. What about for cuff repair? Again, we talk about arthritis and cuffs seem to be the most common applications for biologics, so I've highlighted those here. This was a study looking at 35 patients with cuff repair compared to 35 patients with cuff repair plus adipose derived cells. And the authors found no difference in clinical outcomes, but higher um, healing rates or lower re-tear rates in the adipose group. So something to think about in terms of the, the biologic augmentation of cuff repairs. Last but not least, amniotic derived injection treatments. This is a very controversial topic, particularly since the FDA said that they are going to uphold their restrictions starting in November, 2021. So um, just about a year ago. Um, the big question with Amnion is number one, with the off the shelf products, are there cells? We don't know. Are there just growth factors? Perhaps, but we like growth factors. So is it a bad thing? Probably not. Is it safe? Yes but what are you selling and what are you advertising? So big questions, I don't have the answers for Amnion, but I would say be cautious because it's currently not FDA approved and that's why the companies have pulled their trials. What about direct visualization? Normally I don't give these lectures back to back, so this would be the first time I'm showing you the needle scope, but you can certainly use the needle scope to directly inject a biologic into your area of choice, be it intraarticular, be it into the ACL, be it into the meniscus, et cetera. All right, summary, and then we have a little time for questions. So I put these in red, yellow, or green in terms of stoplight you know, technique here. So for visco, I put it in green. I think the literature is favorable for mild to moderate OA, but questions do remain in terms of what type, how much, how often, et cetera. And cost is certainly a big issue now in 2022, but green means go. I think you should feel comfortable using HA for OA. What about PRP? Also in green. There's enough literature in 2022 the AAOS is putting out consensus guidelines to talk about this. For mild to moderate OA, this is a symptom modifying treatment that is successful. It is not a disease modifying treatment. What about cellular therapy? I put it in yellow, cautious, be cautious with this. The literature is undetermined for OA yet, but there's growing evidence. It's most favorable for the use in focal cartilage surgery for bone marrow, but OA can be treated with adipose in some studies, so something to look forward to. What do I do for my patients with NeoA? My first option, let's talk about it. I do steroid injections. Most, most people do steroid injections, particularly as a first line treatment for a hot inflamed knee. But we also talk about the other options and we typically go to leukocyte poor PRP. It's often cheaper than HA. The literature head to head shows PRP is a little bit better. We'll sometimes offer the cocktail and insurance coverage for HA is so poor that it's hard to ask a patient to pay that much money out of pocket for something that I can't prove will work. Take on points, what should we all do? Be transparent and upfront with patients, disclose financial relationships, be careful with marketing, understand what you're putting into the patient and why. And as always, with everything we do, under promise and over deliver. With that, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. I wanted to let you know about our latest CME event in Charlotte. That's this fall. We're calling it the PAOS Orthopedic Boot Camp. This is intended for those new to orthopedics, or if you want to brush up on your orthopedic assessment and clinical knowledge, 
this course is for you. Please register online at paos.org CME. I hope we see you there.